Minister of St. Gertrude in Madeira. Thank you for listening to Sacred Heart Catholic Radio. 740 WNOP Newport, 910 WPFB Middletown, or get the app, stream, podcast, and more at sacredheartradio.com. As we continue on this Wednesday, April 10th, we are in the octave of divine mercy. Let's pray together in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Lord, save us from the prison of the narrow mind and the shuttered heart. Deliver us, O Lord. From the confinement of our sinful habits. Deliver us, O Lord. From captivity to our self-will. Deliver us, O Lord. God of mercy, you poured forth upon us the spirit of the freedom of the children of God. As you opened the prison cells to which the first disciples were condemned, open every gate that stands between us and the freedom to love you and our neighbor. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Those prayers come, uh, at least that one came from the Magnificat app. Uh, they don't pay me to say this, but getting a Magnificat app subscription, money well spent. I use that thing every day, multiple times daily. It is the Sunrise Morning Show. Thanks for being with us on a Wednesday morning. I'm Matt Swaim. Anna Mitchell has news. Paul Lockman at the controls. And Travis has a video feed up and running. You can check that out. Uh, check out the Facebook stream and the YouTube live stream. That's in the show notes at sunrisemorningshow.com. Link straight over. Dr. John Bergsma will be along. He's going to talk about love in the book of Revelation. Father Rob Jack will unpack a prayer that you hear, at least on Sacred Heart Radio, three times a day on most Catholic radio stations. You hear it at least once, and that is the Angelus. And uh, it is a powerful prayer, and it's connected with the Annunciation, which we celebrated earlier this week. Gary Zimak will talk about how the resurrection can give us confidence in Christ and then Deacon Stephen Gray Donis uh, will unpack more religious themes in the film Cabrini, which uh, by now I know a lot of you have seen because I've talked to some of you about it. Right now, though, it is two minutes past. Here's Anna Mitchell with news. Good morning. The Arizona Supreme Court has revived a near total ban on abortion in the state. The law was first enacted in 1864 and bans all abortions except for risk to the mother. Pro-abortion supporters have condemned the ruling and have been collecting signatures to put abortion on the ballot in November, which, if passed, would enshrine abortion rights in the state constitution. President Biden will be meeting with Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida today in Washington for an official state visit, where the two are expected to announce several new agreements. More from Mark Mayfield. A new deal on bolstering chip making and strengthening supply chains will likely be on the table. Before heading for the U.S., Kashida said he wants to reinforce the fact that the two countries remain strong global partners. Later on this evening, the leaders will take part in a state dinner with the legendary Paul Simon slated to perform. I'm Mark Mayfield. The parents of a Michigan school shooter are each being sentenced to 10 to 15 years in prison. James and Jennifer Crumbly were convicted in separate trials of involuntary manslaughter for the 2021 shooting deaths of four students by their son at Oxford High School north of Detroit. It's the first time in the U.S. that the parents of a child mass shooter have been held responsible. During sentencing, the couple expressed remorse but maintained they had no idea what their son was planning. Their son pled guilty to all charges at the age of 17 and is serving life in prison without parole. Norfolk Southern says it has reached a massive settlement following the February 2023 train derailment in East Palestine, Ohio. The $600 million settlement would resolve all class action claims within a 20-mile radius of the derailment and would take care of personal injury claims by residents who live within a 10-mile radius of the site. 
Norfolk Southern says the settlement is not an ambition of wrongdoing or liability. The settlement will now need to be approved by a court. The Vatican's Secretary for Relations with States and International Organizations is visiting Vietnam this week. From Vatican Radio, Devin Watkins reports. Archbishop Paul Richard Gallagher began his journey to Vietnam on Tuesday, where he will remain until Sunday, April 14th. The ex-account of the Secretariat of State released his schedule as the English-born archbishop departed. The schedule includes meetings with foreign affairs ministers and Vietnam's prime minister. He will also hold diplomatic encounters at the Ministry of the Interior and preside at a Eucharistic celebration at St. Joseph's Cathedral in Hanoi. Archbishop Gallagher's program includes a visit to the ecclesiastical province of Hue to meet with major seminary students and preside over a mass at Hue's Phu Cam Cathedral. Diplomatic relations between the Holy See and Vietnam have seen a renaissance over the past year. Vietnamese President Vo Van Thuong visited with Pope Francis in the Vatican in July 2023. The two states agreed to appoint a resident pontifical representative in Vietnam, a step towards full diplomatic relations and an apostolic nuncio. Diplomatic relations were broken off in 1975, but conciliatory steps have been made since 1990. In 2011, Pope Benedict XVI appointed a non-resident pontifical representative. Pope Francis sent a letter to the church in Vietnam in September 2023 urging Catholic faithful to live as good Christians and good citizens. He urged them to bear witness to God's love without distinction of religion, race, or culture and stressed the importance of recognizing convergences and respecting differences. This approach, noted the Pope, embodies the Catholic's identity by animating their church and spreading the gospel in daily life. Where there are conditions favorable to the exercise of religious freedom, he said, the witness of Catholics can help promote dialogue and hope for Vietnam. I'm Devin Watkins. The work continues 24-7 to clear debris from the catastrophic collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore. U.S. Coast Guard Commander Roberto Concepcion says the priority is finding the bodies of the three remaining construction workers who continue to be missing since the container ship hit the bridge and brought it down two weeks ago. He says crews have a general idea of where the victims are. And more helmets are coming to the NFL this season. That, according to the league, which announced yesterday that More than double of position-specific models will be available to players. Safety rankings released by the Players Association showed eight of the top 12 helmets are designed for either quarterbacks or linemen. Riddle's Axiom 3D was ranked the highest, which has designs for quarterbacks, linemen, and a standard version for all other players. Only three approved helmet models were rolled out last season. This is kind of interesting to me. It is. Are they going to, in the course of this, bring back the uh, the old kicker helmets that basically protect none of your face have and have like, like one, one bar, bar around across. your chin? Yeah, maybe. <clears throat> My guess Who is knows? no. Um, I but I do find it like the science of this is super interesting to me that they must be analyzing the typical way that you would fall to the ground or be tackled, I guess, or be hit head on, and figuring out how to pad or you know i, I mean, was can wondering you really, about these can you things. prevent your brain from you know rattling Bouncing around in around. your head i don't know so this is this is where some of the debates happen is does the increasing technology and the you know adding of new safety fi- features make people safer or does it make does people it just have make a false more illusion of safety yeah. Safety, and so they feel like they can hit harder without consequences. Mm-hmm. This is the debate. Well, hopefully it's— It's one of the debates. Hopefully it's the former, but— You know, yeah. if we worked for a sports channel, Anna Mitchell, uh, our producer would say, Anna Mitchell, you take the one side. Matt, you take the other side of this debate, yeah, and you guys and go argue with each other. Argue, we'll argue, argue. On YouTube. And then we'll, you know, we'll call, let people call in and be and angry at us. More. and Yeah. It's not a better way to start your day. We should talk about how it's interesting that such a debate exists. And it is. So now you know that the debate exists. It's not the most interesting thing in the world, but it is one interesting thing in the world. Well, now you know the debate exists, and you can maintain your peace for the rest of the day. There you go. This is what we do here on the Sunrise Morning Show. You're welcome. You're welcome. 
today is, what day is today? It's Wednesday. Wednesday, April the 10th. And we are happy to have you along with us here on the Sunrise Morning Show on EWTN. It's nine past. Back with us now on the Sunrise Morning Show is Dr. John Bergsma. We've been going through his book, Love Basics for Catholics. Good morning, Doc. Good morning, Anna. So today we are going to begin talking about the book of Revelation in Love Basics, which to some might sound kind of weird uh, based on what they think the book of Revelation is, but that's why we have you on retainer here. Um, I mean, before we even get into the text itself, how does the name Revelation or Apocalypse even um, give us some marital imagery. Indeed, you know, so we think of apocalypse, and we think end of the world, mm-hmm. fire falling Scary. from the sky, yep. Yep. zombies, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, but actually the word apocalypto means apo, which is off, and calypsis, which is a veil, huh. and it's taking the veil off, which is the same thing that revelatio means in Latin. So the two names for the book, Revelation or the Apocalypse of John, both talking about taking the veil off, and that often referred to the bride removing the veil and being revealed. And that's, you know, just that term, revealed, right? So that's what's going on in the book. The bride of the Lamb will ultimately be, you know, the big reveal at the end of the book. That's incredible. So to kind of get our bearings, to get the big picture here, can you give us sort of, I don't know, the Cliff Notes version, the outline of of what happens in the book of Revelation as we start our study of it? Sure. So the Apostle John's taken up into heaven. Uh, He sees the heavenly worship going on. He gets seven messages to the main metropolitan churches and Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey. Those are edifying to read. Mm -hmm. But then we move into his visions of these plagues. He sees uh, seven seals broken in heaven, plagues falling, seven trumpets blown, plagues falling, seven bowls poured out, plagues falling. And then climactically, around chapter 17, he sees this harlot called Babylon, seated on this dragon with seven heads, and she is destroyed. And then a couple chapters later, down comes the bride of the lamb, sort of replacing the harlot. And then in the last couple chapters, we have this beautiful vision. Usually folks say it's a vision of heaven, which is not wrong. It is. More to it than that, though. And uh, but a beautiful vision of the wedding of the lamb and his bride, and then the whole book concludes by calling the lamb and the bride to come together soon. Wow. Okay, so let's talk about Revelation 17, and uh, as you put it, the main villain of the book of Revelation, the harlot, the the as you put it in the book, the immoral woman named Babylon. Talk a little bit more about this woman. Sure. So I was raised being taught she was Rome, or even better, the Roman Catholic Church. (laughs) (laughs) Very very popular uh, opinion among Lutherans, Mm Seventh-day Adventists, you know, the immoral woman seated on the seven heads. And indeed, the the seven-headed dragon probably is Rome, but when we read this passage, Anna, we should keep in mind the woman is not the dragon. Mm-hmm. She's propped up. Now, to cut to the chase, I argue in greater depth and some other publications, this is the city of Jerusalem propped up by Rome, which is exactly wow. what the political situation was. You know, the Sadducees sure. and the Pharisees got their money and their political power propped up by Rome. And they did that by, you know, sleeping with the Romans politically and uh, cooperating with their policies. And so what we see is the beast in Revelation 17 turns on the woman and burns her up, etc. 
that's what happened in AD 70. Mm. This relationship broke down. Rome turned on Jerusalem, had this fight. Jerusalem was destroyed. But um, the point is, that was the old covenant people of God. Now the church is coming into being. And so the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming out of heaven, prepared as a bride in Revelation 21, this is the new spouse of the Lamb uh, that will be faithful and will experience you know, eternal bliss with her bridegroom. This is so incredible to think about the 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 immoral woman as being the the old city of Jerusalem. I mean, it it fits so well when you think um, you talk about her as a harlot. I mean, that is imagery that's used throughout the Old Testament to talk about the people of of Israel and Judah and, and Jerusalem. Indeed, you know, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Amos. They all use this harlot imagery, oftentimes specifically about the city of Jerusalem. So we see that John just is standing in that prophetic tradition and kind of updating and reapplying what has been a prophetic message throughout Israel's history. Well, we will leave it there for now to uh, dive more into the marital imagery that is found in the book of Revelation in the New Jerusalem next time. In the meantime, you can find Love Basics for Catholics linked at sunrisemorningshow.com. Dr. Bergsma, thank you. As always, talk to you next time. I look forward to it. All right, it's 16 past now on the Sunrise Morning Show. We are back with headlines right after this. Stay with us. Support is from Solidarity HealthShare. Do you have an insurance plan that pays for everything, even things that violate your beliefs? Have you ever felt there has to be a better way, but didn't know you had any options? If you answered yes, I've got some good news for you. There is a better way and a more affordable way. Solidarity HealthShare can save you hundreds of dollars each month while actually supporting your beliefs. Because the best news is that Solidarity HealthShare costs a whole lot less than insurance. It's time to jump in and put your money where your faith is and put some money back into your wallet at the same time. Join Solidarity HealthShare, a faith-based healthcare sharing community. Prices start as low as $384 a month for families. Call to see how much you can save, 844-334-3245. That's 844-334-3245. Solidarity HealthShare, 844-334-3245. It's the Easter season, and the Carmelite Monks of Wyoming have special coffee blends in honor of the resurrection, including Easter Sunrise. And when you purchase some after clicking the Mystic Monk coffee link at sunrisemorningshow.com, we earn a commission. While you're at our site, be sure to check out our online store to get a Sunrise Morning Show mug or travel mug. Support the Sunrise Morning Show while celebrating the rising of the Son of God with Easter Sunrise Blend. Do so at sunrisemorningshow.com. That's sunrisemorningshow.com. Hi, this is Mike Aquilino with a few words about St. Ambrose. Ambrose was governor of the province that included the administrative capital of the Roman Empire. He was a powerful man, but the Catholic people of Milan thought he would make a good bishop, so they made their opinion known, and the emperor confirmed it. Ambrose then set an example forever of what a bishop should be, firm, fearless, and loyal to Jesus. Eighteen minutes past the hour, and Paul is like mixing up the jams on us. Now, what is he doing here, man? I don't know. He's feeling feisty over there on the board. <clears throat> Mix Master Paul. Here's Anna with headlines. The Arizona Supreme Court has ruled in favor of a long-standing abortion law in the state. The parents of a Michigan school shooter are each being sentenced to 10 to 15 years in prison in a hi- an historic case in Michigan, and the Vatican's Secretary for Relations with States and International Organizations is visiting Vietnam this week. All right, Anna Mitchell, uh, a lot of people know we don't have a White House correspondent or a Rome correspondent on mm-hmm. retainer here at the Sunrise mm-hmm. Morning Show. We've got our friends that we talk to, uh, right, and we have right. a newswire. Right. And you spend, during a week when President Trump says that the states should decide abortion and not the federal government, mm-hmm. uh, when Joe Biden says the federal government should definitely decide abortion. 
when the Pope releases a massive document on human dignity and the Arizona Supreme Court makes the kind of moves that the Arizona Supreme Court makes. You spend most of your mornings like these rewriting, rewriting AP headlines and oh rewriting Newswire headlines. Yeah, okay, so— And copy. Yes. Listen to the—this is the uh, way that I am starting the story on the Arizona Supreme Court ruling. The Arizona Supreme Court has ruled in favor of a long-standing abortion law in the state and going on to say they've ruled that a 15-week abortion ban does not override a law from 1864 that banned all abortions. All right, this is now, the way my newswire. The Arizona Supreme Court is upholding an abortion ban which dates back to the Civil War. Whoa, how and antiquated outdated uh, outmoded because anybody from 1864 clearly Obviously. was not enlightened like we are here in By 2024 the... are you kidding me my goodness anna mitchell thank you for what your kind of work. ism is that like current ism i don't know what the word is chronological snobbery yeah. In this crazy world, where can Catholics go with their hard-earned money and not support businesses that go against our faith? Check out the Angels List on SacredHeartRadio.com. It's a list of businesses owned and operated by our Catholic brothers and sisters who underwrite Sacred Heart Catholic Radio. And if you'd like to get your business on the Angels List, email me, Leah, at SacredHeartRadio.com. That's Leah at SacredHeartRadio.com. Support for Sacred Heart Radio is from Twin Dental of Cincinnati. Since 1986, twin brothers, doctors David and Michael Rothen, have been providing superior dental care in a relaxed and comfortable setting for the entire family. The twin dental doctors utilize advanced dentistry techniques from sedation to implants and the latest in cosmetic options to preserve and beautify smiles. Twin Dental, located just off the I-275 exit at Hamilton Avenue. For a complimentary evaluation, 513-825-6111 and online at twindental.com. Pregnancy Center West is committed to protecting the unborn by encouraging encouraging women to see and choose the beauty of life while offering practical assistance for them and their families. Donate securely online at supportpcw.org. That's supportpcw.org. Why wait in endless lines at the pharmacy when Brozard Pharmacy, a proud supporter of Sacred Heart Radio, can fill your prescriptions in a timely manner with high quality. Brozard Pharmacy, fast, friendly service without the wait. 513-941-0428. At times, life is overwhelming, making it hard to find peace and know God's love. Take a step out of life's busyness and into God's presence for an eight-day, personally directed retreat at the Jesuit Spiritual Center. Enter into silence to pray, reflect, and rest. Daily conversations with the spiritual director invite you to explore your own story and connect it to the life of Christ. For more information or to register, call 513-248-3500. That's 513-248-3500. Sunrise Morning Show continues. I'm Matt Swaim, joined now by Father Rob Jack. Uh, Sacred Heart Radio listeners know him as the host of Driving Home the Faith. Uh, perhaps uh, you've heard him in the Archdiocese of Cincinnati where he's a priest, and he's here weekly on the Sunrise Morning Show. Father Rob, good morning. Morning, Matt. So at least on our radio station, and I know a lot of other EWTN affiliates this, do this too, Around 6 a.m., noon, and 6 p.m., we run the Angelus. It's being prayed by all kinds of different priests who have stopped in our studios over the years, and it's such a familiar prayer that a lot of people might not even think about the words of it or why we pray it as often as we do. Uh, If you could, give us an overview of what is happening in the Angelus. Well, what happens in the Angelus is we we call to mind one of the greatest mysteries of our faith, which is the Incarnation. And what we do is that I learned this all the way back when I was in high school seminary. When we'd finish our prayers in the evening, we'd sit in the chapter till 6, and at 6 o'clock, the bells would start ringing, and they would ring nine times. And during that time, we would stand up and recite the Angelus. And so we would basically say uh, an invocation followed by a Hail Mary. So we would say, for instance, uh, the angel of the Lord declared unto Mary, and we and she conceived by the Holy Spirit. And we would say, Hail Mary. And then uh, we the second antiphon was, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, let it be done to me according to your word. And we'd say another Hail Mary. And then we get to the third antiphon, 
And this was a special one that we would say, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And at that moment, we would genuflect to the Blessed Sacrament. And then at the end, we would say, pray for us, O Holy Mother of God, that we may be made worthy of the promises of Christ. And there's a famous painting that you might be familiar with. I'm trying to uh, see if I can get the daggone um, author's name of it. Yeah, I think it's called the um, it's yeah Jean Francois Millet. Yeah, it's, it's just called the Angelus. The painting that's is just right. called the Angelus. And there you see a husband and a wife in the fields, and during the field looks like at the end of the day uh, or early in the morning. You can't tell from the picture. Maybe they're having an eclipse. I don't know. Maybe. But so. um, one of the things that's clear is that they stop their work to take this moment to recall their faith, and so. One of the great principles of this is how Catholics are, St. Paul said, to pray always or to sanctify time. And we do that through the rosary. We do that through the liturgy of the hours. But even some Catholic schools still do this. This happened at the school I was driving past uh, last week. All of a sudden at noon, the, the kids stop playing in the yard, and they, the bells are ringing, and then they stand, they stand and the sister there leads them in the Angelus. And so it's a part of sanctifying the time, part of remembering uh, what it is that saves us, Jesus becoming man, and how um, you know we give thanks for that. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a prayer. It's also a creed, a miniature creed, right? It's a it's us sort of uh, going through a uh, pocket catechesis on the incarnation, <laughs> right? In the course of this, it's, there's a whole lot going on in the Angelus. But you know, I'm reminded. Um, uh, there's a there's a passage in uh, I think it's uh, his book Thoughts in Solitude. Uh, Thomas Merton is talking about all these you know, different reflections, and he talks about as a monk uh, that when the bells ring, everything stops. It kind of doesn't matter what you're doing. Uh, That's right. I think the phrase he uses is the bells say business does not matter. <laughs> right? That's right. It, and uh, when those bells ring, and this is kind of one of the reasons I wish we had more bells active in our uh, in our you know local communities. Just to have that sort of like audio reminder, like, hey, you know, what? I should stop for about ninety seconds here for a, just to just to recollect myself and remember what's most important. Well, this is something that's not only it's it's not just something for Christianity. I mean, they st- in Islam they have the minarets and their call to prayer at certain times of the day, and this is you know our tradition uh, goes all the way back to the eleventh century of taking this moment and having the bells call us to prayer from our work. And this is something that, again, it happened three times a day. It's sun up, it's, uh, it's the middle of the day, and it's sunset. So it's, take, it's sanctifying our time and reminding us that God's grace works all through the day. Well, you know, Father, I am not within earshot of a church bell where I live. And I, I would gather that a lot of people in our listening area don't live near churches that have bells. But I've got this interesting device that is in my pocket and follows me everywhere I go. It turns out I can set as many alarms on it as I want. Yeah. So, I mean, this is the kind of thing that we could probably enforce on our own and even change the ringtone to sound like bells if we wanted to. It's not that hard. That's right. Or you could just listen to Sacred Heart Radio at there certain times of the day, and, and we do that. It's been, like I said, it's been an important part of my prayer life for 40 years, and it's uh, it's just something that's second nature. And you, you recognize that the day stops, and it stops to do what? To think about God. And it, as you said before, nothing is more important than this. The bells are reminding us uh, to to stop in, in, what, in our ordinary life and and touch the touch the face of God. Well, and I would encourage uh, any of you who maybe work in Catholic education, whether you run a school or maybe run a classroom, right, to do what Father Rob was just mentioning. I've known several schools who do this already, uh, or maybe in your home with your family, uh, or maybe if you're just by yourself. I, you're, you're talking like 90 seconds of time, but it is. A, it's a reset button, isn't it? I mean, it, it really kind of just... Whatever you're in the middle of, whatever crazy things are going on, it's a reset button. It really is. And the thing is, is like I said, that to me, the, the key passage, and this is something that always strikes me, is is the middle part, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And at that moment, we not only have the oral prayer, we have the physical prayer. We genuflect at that moment. And even if we're in the middle of the schoolyard, kids will stop, and when they get to that phrase, that phrase is so holy that we genuflect because this is the moment our salvation began. Yeah, and it is a direct quote from the first chapter of John's Gospel right there. So 
You may think you don't have Bible verses memorized, but you do if you're praying the Angelus. So, well, uh, again, this was this was catechesis. People couldn't read and write, but they could remember. Indeed, indeed. Well, Father Rob Jack, thanks so much. We'll catch you on Driving Home the Faith later on on Sacred Heart Radio. Have a wonderful day. You have a good day, Matt. And again, you can find Father Rob and all of our guests linked in the show notes at sunrisemorningshow.com. While you're there, enter your email and subscribe. Half past the hour, here's Anna with news. Good morning. The Arizona Supreme Court has ruled in favor of a longstanding abortion law in the state. The court yesterday issued a 4-2 to two ruling stating that a law passed in 2022 banning abortion at 15 weeks did not override a law from 1864 that banned all abortions except in the case of the life of the mother. The court stated in the ruling, quote, to date, our legislature has never affirmatively created a right to or independently authorized elective abortion. We defer as we are constitutionally obligated to to the legislature's judgment, which is accountable to and thus reflects the mutable will of our citizens, saying, quote, the legislature has demonstrated its consistent design to restrict elective abortion to the degree permitted by the supremacy clause in an unwavering intent since 1864 to proscribe elective abortions absent a federal constitutional right. End quote. There is a 14-day stay on enforcement of this ruling. The bishops of the, Uni- the European Union are speaking out ahead of a vote tomorrow on whether abortion rights should be enshrined in the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. Vatican News reports the title of their statement is, quote, Yes to the promotion of women and the right to life, no to abortion and ideological imposition. In the statement, the bishops of the EU say, quote, promoting and facilitating abortion goes in the opposite direction to the real promotion of women and their rights, saying that abortion can never be a fundamental right. They say the right to life is the, quote, is the fundamental pillar of all other human rights, especially the right to life of the most vulnerable, fragile and defenseless saying defending unborn life is closely linked to the defense of each and every other human right, end quote. Ahead of a humanitarian conference on war-torn Sudan, representatives of aid organizations have held a virtual briefing warning that the nation is facing the worst hunger crisis it has ever experienced. From Vatican Radio, Lisa Zingarini reports. The year-long conflict between the Sudanese regular army and the paramilitaries of the Rapid Support Forces has left more than 8.5 million people internally displaced, 1.5 million displaced in neighbouring countries and over half of the 25 million population unable to meet their basic food needs with famine already setting in. With the conflict further extending and as Sudan enters the lean season, said Annette Hoffman, senior research fellow at the Conflict Research Unit, in the coming months the situation is expected to deteriorate even more dramatically than foreseen only a few weeks ago if no immediate action is taken. This, she said, should include providing seeds and fertilizers to farmers as well as food to the population. She also highlighted that both warring factions are using starvation as a weapon by systematically looting food supplies. Children and women are the most affected by the crisis. Already nearly 4 million children under 5 years old are acutely malnourished. With over 70% of health facilities shut down in conflict areas, limited access to services and looming disease outbreaks compound the threat faced by these highly vulnerable groups. Added to this, said Sofia sprechman Sineiro, Secretary General of Care International, women also face increasing gender violence. In this context, access of humanitarian aid is extremely difficult, while speakers lamented humanitarian agencies are widely underfunded. They therefore insisted that the international community must intervene immediately. I am Lisa Zengarini. Meanwhile, the situation in Haiti is continuing to spiral. A chameleon priest based in Port-au-Prince told Vatican Radio, quote, 
We are barricaded inside the hospital, hoping that they will not attack us. We cannot go out to buy food or medicines for the people we host, disabled children, sick people, relatives of the hospitalized patients, and the medical and nursing staff, end quote. Gang violence continues to reign supreme in the politically unstable country. That's the news. It's 35 past the hour. The Now you can use Venmo to give to Sacred Heart Radio. Just type in at Sacred Heart Radio, all one word, to give a gift of any amount. To help broadcast God's life-giving message over our seven media platforms, use Venmo at Sacred Heart Radio. Support for Sacred Heart Radio is from Schneller Knockelman Plumbing, Heating, and Air. Water heaters, plumbing repair, and drain cleaning backed by Schneller Knockelman's 100% satisfaction guarantee. Schneller Knockelman at skpha.com. skpha.com. St. Vincent de Paul, Northern Kentucky, understands the importance of a helping hand when life becomes difficult. Through the grace of God and the amazing generosity of volunteers and donors, St. Vincent de Paul, Northern Kentucky has been able to provide over $200,000 in rent and utility assistance to nearly 2,000 neighbors in need in the last 12 weeks alone. The prayer is to continue to faithfully serve those in need well into the future. To learn how you can help, visit svdpnky.org and follow along on social media. It's 24 minutes before the hour on this Wednesday, April the 10th. Your forecast is brought to you on Sacred Heart Catholic Radio by Schneller Knockelman Plumbing, Heating, and Air online at skpha.com. More rain today. Right now, it's pretty warm with temperatures in the upper 50s as you're heading out the door. For Cincinnati, rain is likely under mostly cloudy skies with a high today of 63 degrees. Showers pick up tonight and storms are possible with an overnight low of 59. Storm chances again tomorrow and breezy with a high of 67 degrees. For the Miami Valley Dayton area, cloudy with showers today and high of 64. Rain tonight with an overnight low of 57. Showers and thunderstorms tomorrow with gusty winds and a high of 68 degrees. This is Sacred Heart Catholic Radio. The Sunrise Morning Show continues. It is Wednesday, April the 10th. Hope you're having a great morning so far. The day is still young, unless you are a night shifter, because we know that the Sunrise Morning Show is a better way to start your day for many of you. But we also know some of y'all been driving all night or working in the hospital. And uh, shout out to you all for all your great work as well. Gary Zimak now joining us. Followingthetruth.com is where you can find him. We call this our Stop Worrying and Start Living segment. Gary, good morning. Good morning, Matt. So we are in the Easter season, so the tone of the verses we're going to look at is going to be a little bit more triumphant and positive over these next few weeks. Uh, Which verse are we looking at today? You know, Matt, we are looking at the Revelation chapter 1, verses 17 and 18. So we actually have two verses here, and these verses start out with two very important words for anybody who might be struggling with fear right now. And here's what, uh, here's what the verse says. Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Obviously, Matt, these are the words of Jesus reminding us to not be afraid because he really, truly is risen from the dead. He is alive forevermore. He's not going to die again. Therefore, we know he's able to be with us at all times, and I like the way this ends. I have the keys of death and Hades, you know, because of what the Lord did, because he defeated death and opened the gates of heaven, I can live there forever. So this not only covers me for, for this life on earth, knowing that Jesus will be with me, he's telling me that I have a place with him in heaven after I die. So, I mean, that covers it all, I think. Yeah, this is sort of, if you wonder where this falls in the book of Revelation, this isn't how the book of Revelation ends. This is actually how the book of Revelation begins. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, you can you can sort of understand, like, when the story is over and everything is, uh, you know, kind of settled and Satan is bound and the, you know, the people of God are at the wedding feast of the Lamb. This sounds like it would make sense to say it. Jesus actually says this before all the crazy stuff happens in Re- Revelation. 
Like before the plagues and the earthquakes and the fire <laughs> falls from heaven and the demons roam the earth and all this stuff, Jesus tells everybody before he tells John before all that that he's in charge. Right, right, and that really sets the tone for the the entire book, and it it it's just a perfect reminder for us and. You know, we, I, I come on the show, I've been doing this for so many years with you now, Matt. These verses, they, they sound simple sometimes, and they, they are, basically. It's a simple message, but it's one that, with the help of the Holy Spirit, can really be life-changing. You know, I can, I can read these words, and I've read them before. Maybe they didn't move me, but at some point in time, a verse like this has, it really has the power to, to change our lives, because we realize there's nothing to be afraid of. The Lord is with us. He truly rose from the dead, and I think it's hard for us to wrap our brains around that sometimes, especially when we've never really seen anyone rise from the dead. So it's it's something that we need to hear repeatedly, and I really believe whenever I come on with you and I do these segments, I always ask the Holy Spirit for help to open the hearts of anybody listening to them, including myself. You know, the Holy Spirit helps me to realize that this verse, can, I can carry this message with me through the day, reminding me that there's nothing to be afraid of, including death, which is, I think, one of the biggest fears for so many people. The Lord's bigger than death. He defeated death, and this life on earth is not the end of the story. Yeah, uh, that's, that's one of the, the key things, of course, it is the theme of Easter, right, that Christ has yeah. conquered death. Uh, but I... I, I like to key in on this this little passage at the beginning where it says, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I think that it is very tempting with everything that the world throws in front of our faces to put other things first and last in our lives, uh, to have the first thought in our morning be connected to politics and the last thought in our day be connected to politics, or the first thought in our day be a worry about something we are going to have to face the day, and the last thought in our day being uh, a worry uh, as to whether we handled that the way that we should have, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. We, we got a lot of other things that occupy the first and last places in our brains besides he who is the first and the last. Yeah, exactly, and I, and I think you bring up a really key point about the first thought in the morning. You know, um, even before I come on the air to do these programs, I do a little spiritual reading, I do some prayer, and it really starts my day off right. It reminds me of the truth. You know, by, by looking at the news, by scrolling my, my social media feed, I'm, I'm not getting the full truth. I'm just getting a partial truth. What Jesus is saying here is true, and I need to hear that. I need to hear that first thing. I, need, I needed those two words today, fear not, because as I read this over and I was praying about it, I, he was speaking to me, too, and he's reminding me, fear not. I've got this. Whatever this is, whatever you're going to face today, I got it. I'm in control. I'm bigger than death. And, you know, Matt, that's, that's pretty big. So I really can face whatever I'm going to face today. I don't know what that is without fear, knowing that the Lord is in charge, completely in control. He loves me and that he's going to be with me throughout the day. Well, I can't help but think of something. I mean, with the eclipse this week, there are all kinds of people freaking out. Uh, yeah. from all kinds of different perspectives. But if God's creation functions the way that science has told us that God's creation has functioned, then there was an eclipse scheduled for April 9th, 2024, from the moment God put the sun and the earth in the sky. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Because the physics yeah. of it were set to line up from the beginning. Uh, right? I mean, and, and think about yeah. how much fear was just wrapped up in that particular little event, you know? And uh, turns out we're all, we're all all right this morning. Um, we sure are. We sure are. That's April 9th. I'm in April 8th. Yes. I, I don't want you to think I missed the eclipse, Gary. <laughs> You're still waiting, right? <laughs> so wait, what's, what's going to happen? It's dark out right now. I don't know. But, uh, uh, but what would you say to somebody who maybe is having trouble clear in their head, clear in their mind, and remembering uh, you know, through the course of their day that Christ is alive and he's in control? Like, What word of encouragement would you give them as we're here still early in the Easter season? You know, and Matt, it, it's pretty simple, and, and this is something I do every day because I, I, I have struggled with this. It's gotten better, but I, I have struggled with this a lot in the past, remembering the presence of the Lord with me. I start the day by asking the Holy Spirit to help me remember the presence of the Lord throughout the day. I know it sounds simple. 
I often say, Holy Spirit, please make the Father and Jesus more real to me, because that's another big problem for those of us who tend to worry. God and Jesus, they're not real enough to us. Uh, So I really depend on the Holy Spirit. So I would just say that, say that simple prayer, Holy Spirit, help me to remember that the Lord is always with me today. And, and therefore, then we're not trying to do it all by ourselves. And I believe you'll get those little reminders, those little thoughts throughout the day that he is with us. Yeah, and, and that first moment of the day is so important. Uh, St. Jose Maria Escrivá refers to it as the heroic moment. When the alarm goes off, That's right. don't sit around, lay around, stew and worry. Get up, say a quick prayer of thanksgiving. I usually hit the morning offering within like seconds of yeah. <laughs> press and stop on the alarm and we take it from there uh because i know otherwise my first impulse would be like "Eh, let me check my notifications oh yeah (laughs) and that's a bad way to start the day a bad absolute absolutely well gary zimak if our listeners want to connect with you and find maybe some of the resources you put together to help them stop worrying and start living how do they find you matt the best place is to go right to my website following the truth.com Linked at sunrisemorningshow.com. Thanks, Gary. Have a wonderful day. All right, brother. Thank you so much. God bless you. All right. We're back after this with Deacon Thomas to continue to unpack the film Cabrini, which I know many of you have seen already. It's a quarter till. Born from the heart of St. Daniel Comboni, the Comboni missionaries have served the poorest and most abandoned people in the world for more than 150 years. The Combonis improve quality of life with resources like food, clean water, and medicine. They provide vital education in schools and spiritually minister through the sacraments, all while preparing local Christian leaders to serve their people now and in the future. Find out more at ComboniMissionaries.org. Are you longing to hear God's voice? Lord, teach me to pray. The free Ignatian prayer series will open your heart to his voice, to the peace you're seeking, and the only love that fulfills the human heart, Jesus. God is calling you to true joy by knowing Jesus personally. Lord, teach me to pray is free. Just go to lordteachmetopray.com and click on the red box and order the Lord, teach me to pray series. Again, that's lordteachmetopray.com. Have you subscribed to get the Sunrise Morning Show show notes? When you subscribe, the show notes arrive in your inbox weekday mornings with the list of featured guests, books, articles, and websites we'll discuss. And then you'll also get the podcast with markers to quickly find and hear an interview again or to see the Sunrise Morning Show on video. So to know when your favorite guests are on, go to sunrisemorningshow.com and click subscribe. Each weekday, we'll dive into the timeless teachings of our Catholic faith, drawing upon the wisdom of the ages to navigate the challenges of today. Together, we'll seek truth, find inspiration, and forge a deeper connection with God. I'm Deacon Harold Burke Sivers, and I invite you to join me for Beacon of Truth, today at 4 p.m. Eastern on EWTN Radio. Joining us now on the Sunrise Morning Show is Deacon Stephen Gray Donis from DecentFilms.com. Good morning, Deacon Stephen. Good morning, Annie. It is good to have you. And there continues to be a lot of praise, but also a lot of criticism out there of the Cabrini movie. And to boil it down, it seems the question is whether this film was religious enough. Can you parse this out a bit? Sure. Uh, I have to say, when I, I, I've seen the movie a number of times now, and, and when I saw it the first time, I was struck by the fact that uh, although there is a lot of depiction of heroic virtue of uh, St. Francis Cabrini and, and her sisters uh, working themselves you know, to the bone for the orphans of New York and, and for other needy people, uh, there's not a lot of prayer and spirituality and God talk like you expect to see in a faith-based film. So we only see them pray, you know, a grace before meals once. There's no liturgy. Um, uh, There's a scene in the movie where uh, St. Francis Francis talks about um, trusting in themselves uh, and doesn't mention trusting in God. And those are the kinds of things that can raise eyebrows, you know, when especially not only with a movie about 
a, a religious sister and the founder of a religious community, but also a faith-based film. Sure. So what would you say, though, is the key to interpreting this as, as having enough of God, if you will, in this film? Well, the first question, and, and a friend of mine has been asking this question very forcefully in our discussions about the movie, is if you're, if you're talking about secularizing a saint, can love ever be really secular? I mean, if you are feeding the hungry and sheltering the, the, uh, the homeless and clothing the naked, is that secular? Does Jesus regard it as secular? Um, or or is love, does love inherently testify to God? Um, that's, that's the first question. And when you combine it with the not many lines, but strategically placed lines in the movie where St. Francis Cabrini says things like, at the end of our lives, we will be asked one question. What did you do for the hungry, uh, for, the, for the, um, the powerless, for the sick? Um, you know, putting that in the context of, of our eschatological fate, of, of our judgment at the end of our lives, you know, I, I don't need there to be a lot of those kinds of lines in order to give those lines kind of an interpretive force to see her actions throughout the rest of the film as attesting God not only in her own love, but also in the image of God in the people that she's loving. Can you talk about her motto? Yeah. So there's, there's a key scene in the film, and again, it happens at a key moment when she's collapsed, when her life was in danger, and there's the possibility of her dying and leaving her sisters behind. And then she gives her sisters a speech where she says, we have to bear in mind, I can do all things. <laughs> and she pauses dramatically, and I was wondering, oh, gosh, is she going to finish the quote, or is she just going to say, I can do all things? But no, I can do all things, all things through him who strengthens me. This is from Philippians um, uh, chapter 4, and it is it was St. Francis Cabri's own motto and the motto of her religious community. And, and that scene to me really resonates with the movie's emphasis on Mother Cabrini's physical frailty. The first time we see her as she's uh, putting on her wimple and preparing to, um, um, to you know, she's, what she's trying to do is to get Vatican approval for a mission that she wants to undertake to China uh, in order to care for orphans there. And, and the movie makes it clear that when she puts on her wimple, she's, she's really kind of donning armor for battle. It's a spiritual mm -hmm. battle. But we just the weariness on the actress's face, the, the, the sheer exhaustion that she's powering through. I've, I've heard some people say, you know, oh, the movie just depicts her as kind of a girl boss, like she's just super tough. And that's not really true. I, I think that the actress's choices and the deployment of that line from Philippians really show Christ's power made perfect in her weakness. It's precisely her weakness that shows the grace of God at work in her. Does it make any difference that she's wearing a religious habit throughout the film? I mean, I would think that the garb would indicate religion in some way, would it not? Yeah, yeah, it does. And and those two scenes where we see her putting on her wimple uh, with great difficulty and physical frailty, I think those are the most significant. There are a, there's a lot of other religious imagery in the film. Obviously, people are wearing pectoral crosses. We see religious artwork in the Vatican and in the um, the uh, offices of um, the art of the Archbishop of Manhattan of New York. We see uh, there's there's images of the Sacred Heart in their community because their community is devoted to the Sacred Heart of Jesus uh, over their heads when they pray that that Pater Noster, or not Pater Noster, that, that Grace Before Meals, rather. Um, but, but there's another moment in the film, I think, which to me is both the most cinematically interesting and also the most theologically, because it symbolically shows us the face of God himself, God mm. himself actually rescuing Mother Cabrini from hopelessness. This happens when it seems like her mission is completely defeated, and throughout the film, whenever she's at a low ebb, we see these flashbacks to when she was a child, this childhood incident where she fell into a river and she's drowning. And on this occasion, when someone speaks words of encouragement to her, we see a face, a man looking down at her from above uh, while her, the child itself is, is in the river. And then we see him reach into the river to take her hand and to pull her out. And wow. given its placement in the film, symbolically, this is clearly the face of God the Father, God the Father reaching down to her in her at her emotional low point in order to lift her up from hopelessness and, and restore her strength. 
Well, this is really interesting to me because I, I've been thinking about this in the the realm of quote unquote faith based films where we've kind of grown used to being hit over the head with the message when it when it comes to films like this. And and I wonder if if it's made the it made it too difficult to make a <laughs> Uh, a, a real, a good faith-based film anymore. I mean, you know, you wonder what people today would think about, I don't know, the Song of Bernadette or, or Boys Town or The Sound of Music. Um, would they think of these as like faith-based films today? We're so used to being hit over the head with the message that if we aren't clubbed by God in the movie, then it's not religious enough. That's a really, really good question. Um, I, I should emphasize in response to that that there does seem to have been a little bit of, you know, behind the scenes. This is the thing with movies is that it's such a collaborative art form, and different people involved may have different interests. Mm -hmm. um, the, the upshot in this film is that the producers seem to want to make a movie in which God and theology was as much in the background as possible. I even heard that they wanted to cut that quotation from Philippians, oh, wow. which was just not going to work for the film. Uh, but the director, Alejandro Monteverde, he really wanted, I think, to make a movie that honors Francis Cabrini's faith. And so that really comes out not so much in the dialogue but in the actions of the characters and in that very important symbolic moment that I mentioned. Yeah, and I do think it's, you know, important to remember that any participation in beauty is participation in the mind of God. Um, very interesting. And Deacon Stephen has a lot more over at his sub stack. Is there a link to that through Decent Films? Yes, if you go to decentfilms.com, it'll take you right to my sub stack where I explore the question of the faith of God in the movie Cabrini. Awesome. And we've got decentfilms.com linked at sunrisemorningshow.com. Thank you so much, Deacon Stephen Gray Donis. Matt, what did you think on oh, re in regard to this as question? As the bumper music that takes us out of the sh this hour. I know, hour you've got 20 seconds, 30 maybe. I thought a lot of things. I thought a lot of th I mean, I think the one thing that uh, I wish would, would have been nice to see the sisters at mass. Sure. At some point. Um, because you see bishops and stuff but and you see the pope but you don't see what they do mm -hmm. you see the the advice they give or the instructions that they give Absent or the, the way they roll their eyes yeah. at mother cabrini but you don't ever see them celebrating mass it would have been interesting even if it was just like a cut scene like mm -hmm. coming out of mass or sure. something like that but yeah uh it's very much a show rather than tell kind of film yeah. for sure yeah it raises questions hmm. well Another full hour of the Sunrise Morning Show coming up. It's three till. Every time you turn on Sacred Heart Catholic Radio, you hear in the words and actions of Jesus Christ just how much God loves us. Yeah, there's no greater peace than to know what God has prepared for those who love Him. So we must always try to make His love known to others. To give access to God's love today, tell someone about Sacred Heart Radio. 7.40 a.m., 9.10 a.m. and the Sacred Heart Radio app because... What can compare to the love of I am Deacon Mike Erb with Coldwell Banker Realty, proud to support Sacred Heart Radio because I am a faithful listener and I'm happy to help you with buying or selling your home. 513-237-8888. That's 513-237-8888. Hi, I'm Anna Mitchell, MC for Heartbeats for Life 5K, sponsored by Cincinnati Right to Life, Saturday, April 20th at Lunkin Airport Playfield. It's a day of food, family, and fun to keep hearts beating in Ohio. Register at CincinnatiRightToLife.org. Looking for a way to grow closer to your faith with your family this summer? Try a Holy Family Fest at Catholic Family Land, located 20 minutes from Steubenville, Ohio. Family activities along with mass, rosary, confession, and guest speakers create the perfect blend of excitement and ample time spent renewing your faith to allow life-changing encounters with the Lord. Financial assistance is available for families in need. Register online at afc.org. Central Fabricators, proud supporters of Sacred Heart Radio, custom builds and repairs corrosion-resistant storage tanks, reactors, and pressure vessels. These are used to manufacture liquids used in everyday products like health and beauty aids, pharmaceuticals, and food. Central Fabricators uses the latest in technology and modern equipment to deliver quality products, and big orders are not a problem. Central Fabricators, ASME certified, and on the web at centralfabricators.com. 
That's centralfabricators.com. Support is from Solidarity HealthShare. Is inflation making you feel frustrated and out of control when it comes to your expenses? We have a solution. It's Solidarity HealthShare. With Solidarity HealthShare, you control what doctors you go to and how much you spend with pricing options that start as low as $384 for families. Take control of your health care and your budget with Solidarity HealthShare. 855-954-5688. Solidarity HealthShare. 855-954-5688. Schneller Knockelman Plumbing, Heating, and Air are proud supporters of Sacred Heart Radio, home of the 100% satisfaction guarantee because our work is done right the first time. For all your plumbing, heating and air conditioning work. Find us at skpha.com, skpha.com. This is Deacon Mike Erb with St. Ignatius of Loyola Parish in Mumford Heights. Thank you for listening to Sacred Heart Radio. 740 WNOP Newport, 910 WPFB Middletown, or get the app, stream, podcast, and more at sacredheartradio.com. Arise, it's a new day. Hear his word. On this Wednesday, April 10th, let's begin the hour with a morning offering from St. Therese. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. O my God, I offer thee all my actions of this day for the intentions and for the glory of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. I desire to sanctify every beat of my heart, my every thought, my simplest works, by uniting them to its infinite merits. And I wish to make reparation for my sins by casting them into the furnace of its merciful love. O my God, I ask of thee for myself and for those whom I hold dear the grace to fulfill perfectly thy holy will, to accept for love of thee the joys and sorrows of this passing life, so that we may one day be united together in heaven for all eternity. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. It's a better way to continue through a Wednesday morning. If you guys are looking for a good morning offering to uh, start your day with, if you haven't settled on one, you can find the text of the one I just used in the show notes at sunrisemorningshow.com. I'm Matt Swaim. Anna Mitchell has news. Paul Lockman at the controls. Travis has a video feed up and running. You can check out the Facebook and YouTube live streams through the show notes on our site. Uh, Father Philip Michael Tangor is going to be along. He'll give a canon law perspective on Dignitas Infinita, which is the document on human dignity that just came out from the Vatican a couple days ago. Uh, Peter Blute will join us uh, from Young Catholic Professionals. They got an upcoming conference. Some of you who are young and Catholic and professional may be interested in it. Father Augustine Weta has another story from the Desert Fathers, another old monk story and a lesson to learn from it. And then we'll talk about what Catholics mean by the common good. What does the church mean by this concept? of the common good. It's a little bit different than what uh, society at large means by the term, and Ken Craycraft's going to unpack that. Right now, though, it is two minutes past. News a service of Central Fabricators and centralfabricators.com. Here's Anna Mitchell. Good morning. The Arizona Supreme Court has ruled in favor of a long-standing abortion law in the state. The court yesterday issued a 4-2 to two ruling stating that a law passed in 2022 that bans abortion at 15 weeks did not override a law from 1864 that banned all abortion except in the case of saving the life of the mother. There is a 14-day stay on enforcement of this ruling. The bishops of the European Union are speaking out ahead of a vote at the EU Parliament tomorrow on whether abortion rights should be enshrined in the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. Vatican News reports the title of their statement is Yes to the Promotion of Women and the Right to Life, No to Abortion and Ideological Imposition. In the statement, the bishops state, quote, Promoting and facilitating abortion goes in the opposite direction to the real promotion of women and their rights, saying abortion can never be a fundamental right. They say the right to life is the fundamental pillar of all other human rights, especially the right to life of the most vulnerable, fragile, and defenseless, saying defending unborn life is closely linked 
to the defense of each and every other human right. President Biden will be meeting with Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida today in Washington for an official state visit where the two are expected to announce several new agreements. More from Mark Mayfield. A new deal on bolstering chip making and strengthening supply chains will likely be on the table. Before heading for the U.S., Kishida said he wants to reinforce the fact that the two countries remain strong global partners. Later on this evening, the leaders will take part in a state dinner with the legendary Paul Simon slated to perform. I'm Mark Mayfield. The parents of a Michigan school shooter are each being sentenced to 10 to 15 years in prison in an historic case. James and Jennifer Crumbly were convicted in separate trials of involuntary manslaughter for the 2021 shooting deaths of four students by their son at Oxford High School north of Detroit. It's the first time in the U.S. that the parents of a child mass shooter have been held responsible. During sentencing, the couple expressed remorse but maintained they had no idea what their son was planning. Their son pled guilty to all charges at the age of 17 and is serving life in prison without parole. The Vatican Secretary for Relations with States and International Organizations is visiting Vietnam this week. From Vatican Radio, Devin Watkins reports. Archbishop Paul Richard Gallagher began his journey to Vietnam on Tuesday, where he will remain until Sunday, April 14th. The ex-account of the Secretariat of State released his schedule as the English-born archbishop departed. The schedule includes meetings with foreign affairs ministers and Vietnam's prime minister. He will also hold diplomatic encounters at the Ministry of the Interior and preside at a Eucharistic celebration at St. Joseph's Cathedral in Hanoi. Archbishop Gallagher's program includes a visit to the ecclesiastical province of Hue to meet with major seminary students and preside over a mass at Hue's Phu Cam Cathedral. Diplomatic relations between the Holy See and Vietnam have seen a renaissance over the past year. Vietnamese President Vo Van Thuong visited with Pope Francis in the Vatican in July 2023. The two states agreed to appoint a resident pontifical representative in Vietnam, a step towards full diplomatic relations and an apostolic nuncio. Diplomatic relations were broken off in 1975, but conciliatory steps have been made since 1990. In 2011, Pope Benedict XVI appointed a non-resident pontifical representative. Pope Francis sent a letter to the church in Vietnam in September 2023 urging Catholic faithful to live as good Christians and good citizens. He urged them to bear witness to God's love without distinction of religion, race, or culture, and stressed the importance of recognizing convergences and respecting differences. This approach, noted the Pope, embodies the Catholic's identity by animating their church and spreading the gospel in daily life. Where there are conditions favorable to the exercise of religious freedom, he said, the witness of Catholics can help promote dialogue and hope for Vietnam. I'm Devin Watkins. And the Nobel Prize-winning physicist who predicted what became known as the God particle has died. Peter Higgs was a 35-year-old college professor in 1964 when he suggested the existence of a new particle that held the universe together by giving other particles mass. His theory was called the Higgs boson and was later referred to as the God particle, which he, as an atheist, did not like. Peter Higgs died Monday at his home in Scotland at the age of 94. So definitely pray for the repose of his soul. You know what else holds the universe together and gives us mass? God. <laughs> Priests. So I just, I did, I just wanted to in persona out. Christi. God, the whole season. I would love to hear it. Father Philip Michael Tangora, he would tell us for sure that that's true, right? Father, you in Persona Abs- Christi with the Mass, you keep the Abs- universe standing. It was Padre Pio who said that it would be worse for the world if there was a day that went by without the celebration of the Mass mm-hmm. than if the sun never rose. Whoa. There you go. So there you go. That's intense. Very intense. There we are. <laughs> that's me. I'm intense. Yeah, well, we'll have to pull up the passage from the category. In contingent beings that, if ever God, like, you know, takes a day but off, dude, we all blip out of existence. Man. Exactly. No doubt. No doubt. The liturgy is so important for the uh, existence of the universe. I believe that wholeheartedly. Wholeheartedly. Well, 
Father Philip Michael Tangora joining us again on the Sunrise Morning Show. He's a pastor, a canon lawyer, and author of Holiness and Living the Sacramental Life. Father, Christ is risen. Welcome back. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's good to have you. So we are continuing to unpack here on the Morning Show from various angles. The Holy See's Declaration Dignitas Mm -hmm. Infinita. Um, And in it, it listed a a number of things that were labeled as grave violations of human dignity. Now, this declaration itself didn't go into, you know, incredible great detail on on any of them. And I think that probably entire declarations could be spent on on each individual violation of human dignity. But, But this is what we have for now. So what are the canonical implications of this? Well, the summary form, like you were expressing, of each of these, uh, the first thing that it didn't do, which I would have uh, hoped for, was a clarification of the level of doctrinal teaching level for abortion. Mm, sure. Is it de fide catholica divina? Is it de fide tenenda? What is it? Uh, so they didn't even quote or source paragraph 62 of Evangelium Vitae that uh, where Pope John Paul II uh, evokes the dogmatic formula for proclaiming something de fide catholica divina, but uh, has remained questionable for all these years Hmm. on what exact level of teaching authority was evoked 30 years ago almost. So that clarification did not come. Uh, I still think that is very, very necessary because... What difference would that make? Yeah. The second that they say that this teaching, that abort, the condemnation of abortion is de fide catholica et divina, any person, politician or otherwise, who in any way as a Catholic promotes abortion is a heretic. Wow. The second that that is clear that that's de fide catholica et divina, that's huge. That's a game changer, especially in political discourse uh, for Catholics. So that's a very significant moment, and I think that's why they fear actually bringing that clarity. Hmm. However, uh, there are some other things that are very important. One, when it gets into gender ideology and when it talks about transgender and it talks about the fact that it's the mutilation of the body if they incur that kind of a surgery, it's the denigration and the denial of the creator and how they have been created, not just in their uh, personhood, but in their uh, sex and sexual uh, um, preference. Mm -hmm. So all of these three levels are being denied. Now, this is significant because that now provides the clear, concise jurisprudence that, let's say, uh, a woman undergoes a sex change operation to become a man. All right. And now she, he, so she, she whatever it is, yeah. <laughs> yeah, wants to become a priest. And by all intents and purposes, if you went to uh, the vocations director, this person looks like and has the parts, if you will, of a man. Mm-hmm. So the vocations director could be innocently enough duped. Yeah. All right. Yet there is the impediment in Canon 1041, number five, a person who has mutilated himself or other gravely and maliciously or has attempted suicide. So if they've mutilated themselves, which they have, this jurisprudence coming from Dignitas Infinita makes very clear that not only would their uh, ordination be impeded, but it would be invalid. Wow. It was as if it never even occurred because they are in valid matter to receive the sacrament. Mm. Now, one of the things that could also come from this is a dearment impediment concerning matrimony. Matrimony does not have this kind of analogous uh, canon of an impediment. So now let's say a person chooses to change their sex and then they dupe that person into believing that they are now whatever they call themselves to be, Mm -hmm. okay? There is no such impediment, dearment impediment concerning matrimony. So this could lead to the promulgation of a uh, new canon that would provide a dearment impediment for Mm. matrimony 
of someone who is transgender and has undergone such sexual uh, conversion uh, yeah. surgery, well, mutilation. Setting aside how depressing it is that such a thing would be nece necessary, we have to, you know, we've got to live in the day and age that we're in. We were made for such a exactly. time as this. Are there any other, um, you know, well, this is interesting to me that that new canons could be written based on this document, you're saying? Absolutely. From the jurisprudence that it offers, one could envision uh, an imped a dearman impediment for matrimony. And this is significant because then let's say the person now gets married and then they the other spouse realizes, oh, my gosh, I didn't actually marry a woman or I didn't actually marry a man. And uh, they want to get this annulled. They wouldn't even have to get an annulment because That's it's an, just, it's already yeah. impeded. So it's invalid wow. from the get go. Wow. Um, yeah. You know, from the from the standpoint of subsidiarity as well, Father, I, I know that there are, you know, all, all of the bishops conferences around the world have. Um, and, and actually, even more locally than that, uh, individual dioceses have these, you know, pastoral documents, pastoral statements on on, on many of these specific issues. Um, you know, I think about like the USCCB and the, the document, the pastoral statement on, on people with disabilities, for instance, which is another, mm -hmm. um, uh, another category within the, the grave violations of human dignity, um, you know, offenses against people with disabilities. Um, I know Absolutely. a few dioceses have uh, pastoral statements and, and declarations on on issues like abortion and, and these gender ideology issues as well that individual bishops have put out over the years. Uh, so will this declaration from the Holy See lead to, to updates of those documents in some way, shape, or form? Depending upon what was said in those original statements, mm -hmm. this would now be the benchmark. Yeah. All right. So that is a, another significant canonical development. So now this is the benchmark, uh, and we, and any other of those statements would have to uh, express the language and the reality of uh, what is said here. Sort of One of the things line. I found very helpful was the disambiguation of the word dignity yeah. in the first three main mm -hmm. sections there, which was very helpful because of, uh, it approaches it uh, in a way that we can now also classify these things and say, listen, we're upholding the, the person's ontological dignity and we're exhorting it. We're not seeking to have them uh, denigrate their own dignity through these actions. Yeah. You know, yeah. and that we can understand that dignity can be denigrated without it affecting one's ontological dignity, yeah. which is their moral dignity, in fact, Absolutely. Is, is the distinct disambiguation. So not just only as a canonist, but also as a theologian, I, I, I look at it and I say, uh, you know, that there's some very helpful uh, linguistic development in this disambiguation of the word dignity. Yeah, it's nice to have some clarification, certainly. And uh, there is much more to discuss about dignitas infinita, and we will continue to do so here on The Morning Show. In the meantime, Father Phil, we've got holiness and living the sacramental life linked at sunrisemorningshow.com. Appreciate your analysis this morning. Thank you. You're very welcome. It's a dignified purchase if you buy holiness and living the sacramental life. Amen to that, man. More than dignified. It is super dignified to pick up a copy and you can get it through Emmaus Road Publishing. Father, thank you. God bless everybody. You too, Father. Thanks. All right, it's 18 past. We got headlines coming up next. Support is from Solidarity Health Share. Do you have an insurance plan that pays for everything, even things that violate your beliefs? Have you ever felt there has to be a better way, but didn't know you had any options? If you answered yes, I've got some good news for you. There is a better way and a more affordable way. Solidarity HealthShare can save you hundreds of dollars each month while actually supporting your beliefs. Because the best news is that Solidarity HealthShare costs a whole lot less than insurance. It's time to jump in and put your money where your faith is and put some money back into your wallet at the same time. Join Solidarity HealthShare, a faith-based healthcare sharing community. 
Prices start as low as $384 a month for families. Call to see how much you can save. 844-334-3245. That's 844-334-3245. Solidarity HealthShare. 844-334-3245. Hi friends, Janet Williams here. Join me every Wednesday on Women of Grace Live as I welcome new age researcher and blogger for Women of Grace, Sue Brinkman. Sue and I will be talking about all the wacky things that could distract you from your faith. Psychics, yoga, Reiki, crystals, acupuncture, Ouija boards, tarot cards, and astral traveling are just a few of the stranger things we discuss. That's why we call it Wacky Wednesday. So join us at 11 a.m. Eastern on EWTN Radio. 19 past. Here's Anna with headlines. The Arizona Supreme Court has ruled in favor of a long-standing abortion law in the state. The bishops of the European Union are speaking out ahead of a vote tomorrow on whether abortion rights should be enshrined in the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. And the Vatican Secretary for Relations with States is visiting Vietnam this week. News at the top and bottom of each hour every weekday morning here on the Sunrise Morning Show. Grateful to Father Phil uh, from a canon law perspective to look at Dignitas Infinita. Um, in our local hour, we talked to Amy Wellborn uh, yesterday. Oh, I'll be sharing that later. conversation later this week. Yeah. Share that later. Just heard from pastoral counselor Kevin Prendergast, who's going to talk uh, from a counseling perspective some nice. of the questions related to, uh, to gender theory and some of those questions that have popped up anew this week with the release of Dignitas Infinita. So, we're not going to cover it in every single segment, but we are going to try and cover it from a few different angles yeah. this week. Well, there's there a is, lot in there. There's a lot in there. Only 20 pages. But if you get a chance, rather than reading the headlines, read the document. As I like to say, read it, read it. No one wants to be misled. It's 21 past. I'm Father Rob Jack. Join me this afternoon for Driving Home to Faith, where Michael Vanderberg will give us the latest news from Dayton, St. Vincent to Paul. Dr. Ken Craycraft will begin a new series on his book, Citizens Yet Strangers. I'll continue my explanation of the church's new document on human dignity, plus frequent traffic and weather. That's this afternoon beginning at 4 on Sacred Heart Radio. You're on the road to Christ the King. Support is from Catholic Order of Foresters Life Insurance, where you can now make a one-time payment and choose between term and permanent coverage. Agent Rick Nicholas can help. 513-367-0700 to learn more. 513-367-0700. At times, life is overwhelming, making it hard to find peace and know God's love. Take a step out of life's busyness and into God's presence for an eight-day, personally directed retreat at the Jesuit Spiritual Center. Enter into silence to pray, reflect, and rest. Daily conversations with the spiritual director invite you to explore your own story and connect it to the life of Christ. For more information or to register, call 513-248-3500. That's 513-248-3500. Support for Sacred Heart Radio is from Bridgetown Finer Meats, presenting their gourmet fish dinner, available every Friday in Lent, featuring two delectable courses that change every week. Fresh gourmet seafood such as crab stuffed lemon sole with asparagus, Parmesan crusted Chilean sea bass with risotto, or salmon wellington. Every week offers a different dinner. Reservations are required and wine pairings are available. The menu is online at BridgetownFinerMeats.com. That's BridgetownFinerMeats.com. The highest standards, integrity, and best practices are core values at Rainbow International of Cincinnati and Northern Kentucky, your partners in residential and commercial insurance repair and restoration. Rainbow International, proud to support Sacred Heart Radio. 513-271-1000. Joining us now on the Sunrise Morning Show is Peter Blute. He just got a new title with the Young Catholic Professionals. Just announced that on the feast of St. Joseph the Worker, he will be the new executive director. Peter, good morning. Congratulations. Thank you so much, and thank you for the invitation and being back here with you today. Absolutely. So I was reading the press release and learned that you were the second full-time employee for Young Catholic Professionals, and you've been there for, for a decade now. Why have you stayed? 
Yeah, it's it's pretty amazing to think back to those early days when it was uh, me and Jennifer, our our founder, and uh, the the person who I've grown a deep friendship with and a, an appreciation for over these many years. And looking forward now to, um, I, I mean, I think really it's about the impact that YCP has had on the souls of of literally tens of thousands of people across the country. YCP really brought me back to the faith. It was really the catalyst that helped me to re-engage with my faith um, a couple years out of college. Mm. And uh, I've just seen that so many countless times now. And getting to work in this mission and now help to lead this mission in a new way, is it's just an unbelievable opportunity to, uh, to really, I think, help others have the experience that I've had of what it means to really have a relationship with Christ and, and with your, your peers in faith. Yeah, and I love that you're going to be taking over the position on the feast of Saint Joseph the Worker. The you know the motto of of YCP work and witness for Christ. How do you hope to carry that mission forward? Well, I think you know people are feeling very disconnected these days, um, especially young people. You know, those in their 20s and 30s are our primary focus and supporting. And I think they feel that uh, often their work life uh, increasingly has to not include any part of their spiritual life. And so they become almost two people feeling very disconnected and also struggling with kind of often a lack of connection, a loneliness, maybe a lack of direction or purpose. It can be a kind of a complicated world these days to navigate. And so YCP's role is to help them, number one, understand their Catholic faith and really, um, you know, I think have the guidance to to um, embrace their Catholic identity. Number two, we do so in a strong community of peers and of those Catholic leaders who have come before, you know, Catholic business people who can give to the next generation the baton of the faith and the opportunity to step into leadership positions in faith, whether they're in the secular world or, you know, more in, in the Catholic space. Um, and lastly, that ultimately they are called to go back out and share that faith with others and to do so in a joyful and hopeful way. So that's really what YCP does is we bridge the, the gap that often exists between our lives outside of work, especially our spiritual lives, and our work. And how do we infuse those things together in a much, much deeper, more cohesive way? Yeah, and one of the ways that you do that is through your conference, which is coming up at the end of the month. And I know registration is is closing very, very soon. Um, April 26th through the 28th in, in Frisco, Texas. Who are going to be some of the speakers and what what's the theme this year? Well, we have an unbelievable lineup. Our theme this year is workers in the vineyard. So drawing from the many teachings and inspiration of St. Jose Maria Escriva, nice. uh, who, who really, I think, embodied the, the idea of living your faith in, in the daily world, in the world, but not of the world. So we have some unbelievable speakers lined up. Friday night we'll open with Colin Brady, um, who is actually a really unbelievable animator. Um, you know, most people probably don't know his name, but he led the efforts to animate things like Bug, Bug's Life, Toy Story and some of the really, really big cool. films. So we're excited to open with him. Um, we have Monsignor Eugene Morris from Our St. Boy. Louis. Yeah, we love him. Yeah, he's, he's, he's going to be wonderful Saturday morning and celebrating Mass as well. Um, Saturday night at our gala, we've got Harrison Butker, uh, three time, recent three-time Super Bowl champ, wow. uh, Chiefs place kicker. So that's really, really exciting to have him be there, and, and he's been – such a real um, kind of anchor and pillar of faith in a in a highly secular industry, right? He's really, um, mm -hmm. I think, he, he's shown the way, shown the path for being courageous and bold in our faith. So we're thrilled to have him. And then Gene Zanetti on Sunday, who's a, a, a wrestling coach, among many other things. Um, but really great lineup. We're going to have a career fair Friday night, which is a first time opportunity for us um, to bring in great companies that are looking to hire values aligned ta talent from the YCP network from our mm -hmm. member base um, so just just lots of really exciting things uh, to bring together probably 700 plus people from across the country as we do each year fantastic so when is the deadline to register and where can people do so Friday this Friday is the deadline we have a few tickets left you can go to YCP conference dot org 
all the information there. And uh, we really hope that you can join us, even if you're a first time uh, to YCP. This is, you know, we have a decent number of people who the conference is really their first opportunity to learn more about YCP. And they're never, they never regret it. So we hope you'll come out and join us. Excellent. And you can find Young Catholic Professionals linked at sunrisemorningshow.com as well. We've been talking to Peter Blute, the heir apparent as of the Feast of St. Joseph, the worker, May 1st. He'll be the new executive director of YCP. Peter, again, congratulations and thanks for joining us this morning. Thank you so much. You bet. And hey, go over to EWTN.com slash Catholicism and you can download a free ebook called The Twelve Stations of the Most Holy Eucharist, journeying deeper into our understanding of the mystery of the Eucharist and the Eucharistic story of God's love for us from the Old Testament to the Last Supper. Again, that's at EWTN.com slash Catholicism for that free ebook. Half past the hour now on the Sunrise Morning Show, it's time for news. The Arizona Supreme Court has ruled in favor of a long-standing abortion law in the state. The court yesterday issued a 4-2 ruling stating that a law passed in 2022 that bans abortion at 15 weeks does not override a law from 1864 that banned all abortions except in the case of the life of the mother. There is a 14-day stay on enforcement of the the new ruling. The bishops of the European Union are speaking out ahead of a vote tomorrow on whether abortion rights should be enshrined in the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. Vatican News reports the title of their statement is Yes to the Promotion of Women and the Right to Life, No to Abortion and Ideological Imposition. In the statement, the bishops say, quote, promoting and facilitating abortion goes in the opposite direction to the real promotion of women and their rights. Ahead of a humanitarian conference on war-torn Sudan, representatives of aid organizations have held a virtual briefing warning that the nation is facing the worst hunger crisis it has ever experienced. From Vatican Radio, Lisa Zingarini reports. The year-long conflict between the Sudanese regular army and the paramilitaries of the Rapid Support Forces has left more than 8.5 million people internally displaced, 1.5 million displaced in neighbouring countries and over half of the 25 million population unable to meet their basic food needs with famine already setting in. With the conflict further extending and as Sudan enters the lean season, said Annette Hoffman, senior research fellow at the Conflict Research Unit, in the coming months the situation is expected to deteriorate even more dramatically than foreseen only a few weeks ago if no immediate action is taken. This, she said, should include providing seeds and fertilizers to farmers as well as food to the population. She also highlighted that both warring factions are using starvation as a weapon by systematically looting food supplies. Children and women are the most affected by the crisis. Already nearly 4 million children under 5 years old are acutely malnourished. With over 70% of health facilities shut down in conflict areas, limited access to services and looming disease outbreaks compound the threat faced by these highly vulnerable groups. Added to this, said Sofia sprechman Sineiro, Secretary General of Care International, women also face increasing gender violence. In this context, access of humanitarian aid is extremely difficult, while speakers lamented humanitarian agencies are widely underfunded. They therefore insisted that the international community must intervene immediately. I am Lisa Zengarini. Meanwhile, the situation in Haiti continues to spiral. A chameleon priest based in Port-au-Prince told Vatican Radio, quote, we are barricaded inside a hospital hoping that they will not attack us. We cannot go out to buy food or medicines for the people we host, disabled children, sick people, relatives of the hospitalized patients, and the medical and nursing staff, end quote. Gang violence continues to reign supreme in the politically unstable nation. 
The parents of a Michigan school shooter are each being sentenced to 10 to 15 years in prison in an historic case. James and Jennifer Crumbly were convicted in separate trials of involuntary manslaughter for the 2021 shooting deaths of four students by their son at Oxford High School north of Detroit. It's the first time in the U.S. that parents of a child mass shooter have been held responsible. The city of Uvalde has a new police chief. Brian Shook reports. Homer Delgado, who's been serving as interim chief for 11 months, officially stepped into the role Tuesday. Delgado used his first official day as chief to call for changes, saying the day is the beginning of a new chapter for the department. In a memo to the police department staff, he promised a journey of transformation and growth. That department has been under intense scrutiny since a gunman's attack at a local elementary school in 2022. I'm Brian Shook. And the Environmental Protection Agency is imposing its first ever national limits on forever chemicals in drinking water. That's the news. It's 35 past the hour. Dr. Ken Craycraft will sign copies of his new book, Citizens Yet Strangers, at Mount St. Mary Seminary and School of Theology, Tuesday, April 16th at 7 p.m. in the Bartlett Center. For more information, visit sacredheartradio.com slash events. This is Chris Knockelman, owner of Schneller Knockelman, Plumbing, Heating, and Air. Our family has been a proud supporter of Sacred Heart Radio for more than a decade, and we encourage other businesses to do the same. Find us at skpha.com, skpha.com. Support for Sacred Heart Radio is from Hoting Realtors. The current real estate market is challenging, but the professionals at Hoting Realtors are equipped with the market knowledge and tools needed to make home buying and selling easier. 513-451-4800 and at Hoting.com. Hi, I'm Anna Mitchell, MC for Heartbeats for Life 5K, sponsored by Cincinnati Right to Life. Saturday, April 20th at Lunkin Airport Playfield. It's a day of food, family, and fun to keep hearts beating in Ohio. Register at CincinnatiRightToLife.org. It's 24 minutes before the hour on this Wednesday, April the 10th. Your forecast is brought to you on Sacred Heart Catholic Radio by Schneller Knockelman Plumbing, Heating, and Air online at skpha.com. More rain today. Right now, it's pretty warm with temperatures in the upper 50s as you're heading out the door. For Cincinnati, rain is likely under mostly cloudy skies with a high today of 63 degrees. Showers pick up tonight and storms are possible with an overnight low of 59. Storm chances again tomorrow and breezy with a high of 67 degrees. For the Miami Valley Dayton area, cloudy with showers today and high of 64. Rain tonight with an overnight low of 57. Showers and thunderstorms tomorrow with gusty winds and a high of 68 degrees. This is Sacred Heart Catholic Radio. And we hope your Easter season is going well as we're just about a week and a half into it. Remember, Lent is 40 days. Easter is 50. So celebrate accordingly. It is the Sunrise Morning Show. I'm Matt Swaim, joined now by Father Augustine Weta, who, among other things, has compiled a book called Pray, Think, Act, Make Better Decisions with the Desert Fathers. Father Augustine, good morning. Good morning and happy Easter still and future Easter and past Easter and present Easter. There you go. All in the middle <laughs> of everything. So Yeah, uh, it goes on and on, it which does is indeed. great. I love it. I love it. And everything is like blooming. It's perfect. It's perfect. It is. Um, So as we always do here, we get to start off the segment with an old monk story. And this one involves uh, Father Anthony complaining about things not being fair. So I wonder if you could share that with us. Uh, Let's see. Oh, I I got the wrong quote. What page is it on? (laughs) Oh, Father Anthony was worried about God's judgment and prayed, saying, Lord, why is life so unfair? Some die young and others old. Some are poor and others rich. But most importantly, why are evil people so well off while good people wind up oppressed by poverty? (laughs) A voice came to him saying, Antony, God knows what he's doing. Mind your own business. (laughs) Yeah, I, I, 
uh, of all the Desert Fathers quotes, this is probably the one I quote the most, uh, because all this worrying that we do about the future is really kind of pointless if we have faith in God's providence. Uh, but even even from a secular point of view, it's it doesn't do a lot of good to worry about the future. Um, there's this fellow named Gregory Treverton that I I read a book of his in preparation for writing this one, and he's a national security expert. He wrote a book called uh, or no, he wrote an essay for the Smithsonian called Risks and Riddles. And he discovered he, he distinguishes between puzzles, which you can simply collect enough, enough information to solve, and a mystery, which is an attempt to define ambiguities. So, like a puzzle, well, a puzzle is. Um, let me think. Uh, how many cows can you fit inside that truck? <laughs> Boy, that's an odd one. Uh, but a, a mystery is why would you want to? <laughs> yeah. You can collect enough medical and psychological data, but there's no guarantee you're ever going to have enough information to be certain about the future or to be, even be certain about your own feelings for that matter. Or, um, or, or even other stuff like uh, why did I choose this particular shirt that I wore today? Like I, yeah. I mean, I, I, I sort of know why, but I sort of don't know why. Like it, you know, I mean, you don't have these problems right. as a monk the same way I do, but there are all these things that fall <laughs> into this realm. But, but also, uh, too, when this this question of, of of life being fair and unfair, I think it's also because we are constantly comparing ourselves to other people. I, I mean, you know, this as a yeah. high school teacher, like, why are most people unhappy? It's because they look at somebody else and think, why isn't my life more yeah. like that person's? Or how come that person got that thing when I'm like? trying not to be a jerk and the jerk gets all the girls right like it, these are the things yeah. that like cause us to be obsessed with uh ingratitude and and not being okay with our own state of life and thinking everything's unfair yeah yeah that's the phrase you get most often in high schoolers is it's not fair it's just not fair but but life life just isn't fair god isn't necessarily fair either i mean he chose if if i were god and I'm going to be fair about it. I would have chose the Greeks as my chosen people, not the not the Israel, not not Israel, uh, or for that matter, the Romans, or even the Egyptians had some great philosophy, you know, and, and some an incredible architectural acumen. Why not choose them? It, that 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 really isn't fair. But in in the uh, theological world, we call that the scandal of particularity, and. And it and it actually factors into how we make decisions because, you know, virtually all of our great life decisions, or and even actually most of our small ones, are mysteries. And, and and we think if we can just get a little more information, we'll be able to solve it. And that, I think you've mentioned analysis paralysis before. Mm -hmm. That you keep thinking if I could just uh, if I could just play the field a little longer, I might find the perfect person or the perfect spoon or the perfect hat or whatever. Or I wouldn't but, be standing in line at Baskin Robbins for 25 minutes figuring out which ice cream to order, you know, that sort of thing. Right, right. So Anthony's mistake isn't that he's, it isn't really that he's uh, mad about the unfairness of the world. It's just thinking that he might be able to explain it. <laughs> Uh, only only God's infinite intellect can comprehend the all the factors that go into the world's unfairness, not to mention my own grading my students. <laughs> right, I should right. quote that more often to them. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it you know it is interesting. We're having this comment uh, and and conversation about God being fair and life being fair, coming off the heels of divine mercy, which mercy is decidedly not fair. Right. I mean, yeah. it is it is exactly the opposite of fairness. If we were to get right. fairness and justice, you and I would have been like, you know, reduced to ashes years ago. Yeah. Yeah. The fairness I found tends to be the way we compare ourselves to others. That justice seems to be sort of what we deserve. But fair is when we start looking around at other people and seeing what they got. 
right? Like the workers in the vineyard, you know, that it's not fair. I worked all day and they didn't. But uh, I, I think it was, um, well, I thought it was St. Augustine who said that all heresy is an attempt to cage light. Mm. Uh, but then I checked this out with a, an Augustine scholar and he couldn't find it. So if there's anybody out there in your audience who knows which saint said that, uh, Tony will hit me up because it's such a beautiful idea or, or way of put, consolidating this idea that, you know, the future is this infinite mystery. And to try to boil it down so that it's small enough to make your make up your mind it is an attempt to cage light, mm. which really, I mean, the future, the mystery of the future is something sort of beautiful anyway. You shouldn't want to try to go cage it or, 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 or railroad it into a particular result. Yeah, and interestingly enough, when the church talks about why superstition is bad and why uh, yeah. you know, uh, you know, consulting psychics and doing all these other things is bad, it's because you're trying to control your future, right? You're trying to yeah. harness the power of nature to remove all mystery, to be in control of your own destiny, destiny. and the church is like, yeah, you shouldn't do that. Or to hijack God's providence and make it right. your own. Yeah, yeah exactly. Good stuff. I was going to try and find that, but just like your St. Augustine quote, I don't have time to flip through these things in the middle of a live interview. It's just, just, just too much going on. But Father Augustine, if people want to find your book, uh, it's called Pray, Think, Act, Make Better Decisions with the Desert Fathers. How do they do so? Uh, anywhere the great books are sold, but in particular, if you want the money to go straight to Ignatius Press, go on their website and find it, or you can come on to my website and I'll provide a link. Very good. We got you linked at sunrisemorningshow.com. Thanks so much, Father Augustine. Have a wonderful day. You too. God bless you. I love those conversations, man. I learn something great every week from Father Augustine. It's a quarter till. We're back right after this. For more than 150 years, the Comboni missionaries have served the poorest and most forgotten people. With our founder, St. Daniel Combonius, and inspiration, we work for the full development of the human person through evangelization, education, and advocacy. Your donations make a huge impact, and 95% are used to fund our many projects. Find out more at kombonimissionaries.org. That is kombonimissionaries.org. Central Fabricators is proud to support the Sunrise Morning Show, where you'll get news from the Catholic perspective while keeping you up to date on what's happening in the Vatican as well. It's also a great way to keep in touch with the Catholic faith throughout the week. Central Fabricators, based in Cincinnati, Ohio, is a family-owned business for over 75 years, manufacturing and repairing corrosion-resistant storage tanks, reactors, and pressure vessels. On the web at centralfabricators.com. That's centralfabricators.com. Happy Easter! We're celebrating the resurrection and the Carmelite monks of Wyoming have some special coffee blends in honor of our risen Lord, including Easter Sunrise and Pascha Java. And when you purchase Easter-themed beverages through the Mystic Monk Coffee link at sunrisemorningshow.com, we earn a commission. While you're at our site, be sure to check out our online store to get a Sunrise Morning Show mug or travel mug. Grab a mug and link to the Mystic Monks for your Easter coffee at sonrisemorningshow.com. Another great podcast on EWTN Podcast Central is The Word on the Word with Veronica and Melissa. It gives you a deeper look at this Sunday's Mass readings. You can go further into God's Word every week. You can hear The Word on the Word and other faith-filled podcasts from our friends and affiliates around the world, all in one place, all free at EWTN Podcast Central. Visit EWTN.com slash radio and click on Podcast Central today. Following the advice of others? Tell us how that's working out or not. Later on Take Two with Jerry and Debbie on most of these EWTN stations. Now back to the Sunrise Morning Show with Anna Mitchell and Matt Swain. Sunrise Morning Show legal and political analyst Ken Craycraft is back with us now. He's a professor at Mount St. Mary's Seminary, author of the new book, Citizens Yet Strangers Living Authentically Catholic in a Divided America. He had a book signing last night here in the Cincinnati area and has a couple more 
coming up in the next couple of weeks for our local listeners. Ken, good morning. Good morning, Annie. Good to be back with you. It is good to have you. Christ what are is those? Risen. Indeed, he is risen. And what are those dates for the the upcoming book signings? Well, I have one April 11th at St. Gertrude Parish in Madeira. If people are in Southwest Ohio, uh, they uh, al almost certainly know where St. Gertrude is mm -hmm. in Madeira. It's run by the uh, Dominicans of mm -hmm. St. Joseph Province. That's uh, next Thursday, the 11th at 7 p.m. And then the next one is at my the seminary where I teach, Mount St. Nice. Mary Seminary uh, here in Cincinnati. That one is Tuesday, the 16th. 16th. Yeah. 16th and that also is at 7 p.m. so we're nice. looking for hoping for a big turnout at, at both of those excellent so local listeners get on it you can get a signed copy of citizens yet strangers which we are uh, continuing our series on it and we're gonna start learning the language of Catholic political thought or rather start unlearning some stuff so that we can learn the Catholic language uh, there's this term the common good and I think to understand the church's definition, we need to understand how like Protestant and secular liberal thought get this wrong from the start. So am I right in this? They think the common good is basically individual freedom. Can you explain this a little further? Yeah. So what I, what I do in the book, Annie, is the first in the first chapter, basically, as I've described it in other places, basically the first chapter is my negative chapter. It's mm -hmm. my it's sort of my tearing down of, of what we think that we understand or believe and, and what we think the words that we use uh, mean. Uh, which is not often what they actually mean. I compare it actually to uh, we this uh, it, fr from January through uh, through the middle of March. We were doing some remodeling of our kitchen, and so the the first part, of course, was the demolition, mm -hmm. and uh, it looked pretty bleak in, in the midst of that demolition. <laughs> and now it's all finished. We built it all back up, and it's beautiful, nice. and it's different, and it's shiny, and it looks wonderful, and we're so happy. So in the first chapter, I'm doing some demolition. And part of the demolition is to explain why it's very difficult for we Catholics even to speak to ourselves in terms of Catholic language, such as the common good, uh, much less to be able to articulate a Catholic definition in public, because we've already been over our, our definition, if we use any such term like that at all, has already been overdetermined or overdefined by the liberal society in which we live. And so this includes the common good. So, and we'll talk in a couple of weeks when we get to the chapter where I describe the four pillars of Catholic social doctrine, but a good place to start is disabusing what most people think about when they think about common good, because it takes, it, it, we have to start by that disabusing before we can actually start to talk about what it really is. And so what I discuss in the book is my, the difficulty in doing that, but I begin with the very notion of the common good. And what most people think, first of all, it's rarely used in American discourse anymore yeah. at all. But even when it is, uh, the common good usually is defined not in the way that we will define it later in the Catholic context, but rather as the uh, accumulation of individual goods, which is which defines the common good as not common and not good. <laughs> and what I mean by that is, we, if we think about St. Augustine's understanding that, that we are ordered towards something in the city, uh, or, or, you know, in the country to, or in the, in the, in the, the nation. Uh, but, you know, of course he used the term city. So we're ordered, if we're ordered towards something in common, then we all work for that in common and we all work for and toward that common goal. And of course, St. Augustine famously said that, you know, the, the earthly city is not a true city, but the reason it's not a true city is that not everyone is working toward the same uh, goal. And that is toward, uh, ultimately toward uh, uh, rest in God. Um, but everybody is working for their own goal. So he says the city is defined by two loves, the city of uh, the earthly city by love of man, the heavenly city by love of God. Mm -hmm. Well, we live in an earthly city. The problem, and therefore the common good to the extent that it's used at all is not the pol uh, political structure and the, so and the, uh, the cultural uh, reality working for uh, rest in God in a common way, but everybody working for their own good and calling that the common good. So what it really means, what it winds up meaning is not common and not good because yeah. it's disparate, because it's every individual pursuing his own good, and it's not good because it's every individual pursuing love of self rather than love of God. 
and this is this is a description of the earthly city and 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 it's not and that part of it is not necessarily unique to the US i think the US is uniquely positioned for that idea of the pursuit of individual goods and calling it common goods in ways that other nations are because as i mentioned the last time we talked the, the US is not a nation that is defined by a demographic or an ethnicity or even really a language but rather by an idea and that idea itself is corrosive of any notion of common good because the idea institutes into the very political body the pursuit of love of self. Mm -hmm. And when we do that, then we can't even really talk about the common good because we're talking about disparate goods, and not that, common good. And those who are who would be proponents of this, like, OK, well, I'm going to. It, you know, I'm going to I'm going to go for my own good and then the accumulation of all of our goods will be the common good. Well, yeah. what happens when your good goes up against my good and and then we have a fight. Right. But but uh, yeah. but there's they have this idea that that somehow we are we are going to respect each other's goods somehow. That, that That is exactly right, and that goes to the point that we've also made uh, prior in, in this series, and that is that we already have defined our the basic moral category as our individual pursuit of autonomous rights. And if, 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 if we define, if we begin with the basic definition, the basic moral definition of the uh, autonomous pursuit of individual rights, then we wind up uh, at some point with our rights conflicting against one another in the pursuit of common good, and, and therefore any hope even of a common language or a common understanding of what is the good falls apart. And I, and I think just empirically, Annie, it just seems to me that this is the least controversial part of my book, because <laughs> I think empirically it's just not deniable that this is where we are in American society, where everyone pursues his own good and his own love. Now, of course, it is the fact that people still congeal in factions. Uh, and I think congeal is the right word because yeah. it's, it's sort of a gelatinous and and and, ick, and icky uh, type of situation that we're in with all of these factions to fighting against each other. And then, of course, uh, as you as you say, what happens then is we need we need a a strong adjudicator between those competing rights. And this is why I use Thomas Hobbes as my foil in the book because Hobbes understood that that strong adjudicator was a strong authoritarian state. And so we see people who pursue their own individual disparate goods, which leads to an authoritarian state, and then pr complain about the authoritarian state that it leads to. <laughs> and that's the dilemma that we're in. Amen. Thank you so much, Ken Craycraft. The book is called Citizens Yet Strangers from Our Sunday Visitor. And again, if you're here in the Cincinnati area, there's a book signing and reading tomorrow night at St. Gertrude in Madeira. Hope you can make it out for it, 7 p.m. Again, St. Gertrude in Madeira. And you can find Ken's book linked at sunrisemorningshow.com if you're a member of the national audience and can't make it to Cincinnati for the signing. You know, I'm sorry, but you should still pick up the book. Anyway, that'll do it for this national edition of the Sunrise Morning Show. May God bless you and keep you and grant you his peace. Have you made a sound investment to ensure that the Catholic Viewpoint and the Gospel of Jesus Christ are broadcast over Sacred Heart Radio's seven media platforms nonstop? If you have, thank you. But even if you've just recently discovered Sacred Heart Radio, by becoming a member of our family, you actively participate in the media distribution of the truth. So to join now, use Venmo at Sacred Heart Radio. Thanks, welcome to the family, and please tell everyone about Sacred Heart Radio and the Sacred Heart Radio app. I am Deacon Mike Erb with Coldwell Banker Realty, proud to support Sacred Heart Radio because I am a faithful listener, and I'm happy to help you with buying or selling your home. 513-237-8888. That's 513-237-8888. A wedding is a day. A marriage is a lifetime. Catholic Engaged Encounter Weekends are a marriage preparation program led by married couples and a priest or deacon. This is time for a couple to learn about each other and their upcoming marriage. Based on communication, intimacy, and the family they grew up in. Find out more at cincinnati-covington.engagedencounter.com. That's cincinnati-covington.engagedencounter.com. Support for Sacred Heart Radio is from Honda East. With their exclusive Life Care Plus protection, if something goes wrong with your new Honda, you're covered. Help me, Honda East.
Get the car that I want. Online at HondaEscentsy.com. Support for Sacred Heart Radio is from Dr. Robert Berger at Beacon Orthopedics and Sports Medicine. Dr. Berger has been recognized by Cincinnati Magazine nearly every year over the past 20 years as one of the top physicians in orthopedic surgery, and he serves as team physician for Xavier University, Mount St. Joseph University, and LaSalle High School. Dr. Berger treats patients of all ages at the Beacon West office on Harrison Avenue and on the east side at Cincinnati Sports Club. For more information, 513-354-3700. Online at beaconortho.com. Support for Sacred Heart Radio is from Sunset Janitorial Supply, a Catholic family business supplying the tri-state cleaning industry with commercial cleaning supplies, personal hygiene, equipment, and even machine repair. Free delivery to your business. More information at sunsetjanitorialsupply.com. Dayton Right to Life Foundation, proud supporter of Sacred Heart Radio, presents their fundraiser, Speak Out for Life, an evening with college football All-American and motivational pro-life speaker Mark Halk. Tuesday, April 30th. Register online at DaytonLife.org. That's DaytonLife.org. Support for Sacred Heart Radio is from Lefke Tree Experts. For residential or commercial tree pruning and removal, brush clearing, storm cleanup, and more, Lefke Tree Experts, 513-325-1783, 513-325-1783. This is Archbishop Dennis Schnur from the Archdiocese of Cincinnati. Thank you for listening to Sacred Heart Catholic Radio. 740 WNOP Newport, 910 WPFB Middletown, or get the app, stream, podcast, and more at sacredheartradio.com. Arise, it's a new day. Hear his word, let us pray. The sunrise morning show. 